Well, praise the Lord, everybody. This is Pastor Nathan Brozier, and I'm joined today by the Reverend Dr. Bishop William Keith O'Neill from Destiny <laughs> Christian Center International. And I appreciate every one of you joining each week. And by the way, I, I do appreciate it. Many of you have been messaging me and thanking me about some of the some of the content that we're bringing out. So and this is what it's all about. We just want to bridge the gap, let you get insight of some of the leaders in, in, in at least Delaware County and even the surrounding areas as we go by or in the, in the future. So, But I'm excited to be joined by my mentor, my bishop. Uh, many of you know him as Pastor Keith, Bishop O'Neill, but now he's Dr. Keith as well. <laughs> and so, Bishop, give, us a, give our viewers a little insight to where you all begin. Were you raised in a Christian home? Um, I, I guess in its own way, it was not a Christian home per se. Um, I was... Uh, made to go to church, of course, uh, but my parents weren't at that time deeply involved in church activities per se, so I guess half and half. I had cousins that were in church and deeply embedded, and so I went there a lot, and so um, uh, I guess I was kind of a hybrid, let's put it that way. And so um, as I grew up, you know, being a, a part of going to church at least every now and then. I had a God consciousness, and I knew some of the Bible stories, because back in those days, you know, we had Sunday school, sure. you know, and so we learned a little bit about uh, things back then. But then, you know, as I got older, I, I came to faith, so to speak, uh, when I was 22 years old, and so that kind of started the clock in terms of me uh, pursuing the things of God. Well, I know you said you've been a pastor for over 30 years. I, I can't remember. How many years have you been pastor? Well, I, I was an assistant pastor for a total of 23 years between two churches. Okay. And then, of course, Destiny is 15 right. years old. So uh, I know that's that new math. And all. <laughs> right. <laughs> but right. I think uh, 30 plus years for 30 sure. 30 plus years. Now, you've been called into the ministry to do what you've been called to do. Um, when did you receive that calling, so to speak? When did and, and tell us a little bit of how that transpired. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 very different for everybody. And you know, we were talking earlier as we were preparing for this. You know, as far as COVID and the vaccine and different things that are going on and how uh, this stuff affects everybody differently. Sure. And, and you can't really anticipate what's going to happen. You just go there and then whatever happens. It's kind of similar. Uh, my call was, and even how God deals with me now, it's not some real big, I know I've heard of people saying, well, God spoke to me, right. and it's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mine was just not like that. It was just a constant nudge, mm -hmm. you know. Like I said, I came to faith at 22. By the age of 23, within that first year, I knew, just down, just down in my spirit, that I was going to pastor at some point. I had begun to kind of minister. I was a music guy, so I was already in music ministry to some extent. And so it was kind of a, a light nudge, but it, it was obvious enough to know that this was God. So it's not like it's ambiguous, I'm just going down this road. No, I knew it was God, but it wasn't as dramatic as I've heard some people uh, tell in terms of their calling. So I just knew down in here that God was calling me to that place. Now, interestingly enough, I didn't pastor for 20 plus years later, which is interesting in and of itself. I didn't start pastoring Destiny. How, how old did you say you was when you received the calling? So I, I, was, I was about 23. 23. Yeah, I was okay. about 23 when I really knew okay. I was going to pastor. But I wasn't hustling. That wasn't my life dream or anything like that. So I was patient and yeah, yeah I did my thing and didn't end up planning Destiny uh, until I was 45. So, okay. yeah. Interesting. <laughs> now, before you launched out on your own to start Destiny Christian Center, can you talk to us about some of the spiritual leaders that impacted you prior to Destiny's launching and what leadership things or what leadership things did you take from them as well? Sure, sure. Well, yeah, as I said, at 22, I came to faith. It was at um, a traditional Pentecostal church, okay. and some would say, uh, well, at the time, it was not a Church of God in Christ church mm -hmm. because they had pulled out of uh, officially of the Church of God in Christ. Um, but it was a, a church called Faith Center for All Nations. Mm -hmm. And the church that I got saved under uh, is Bishop Jerry L. Maynard. And he is pastoring actually a mega church in Nashville now. Right. Um, but uh, when I came to faith, um, he was my leader, and he was a great leader. He was a, an educated man, uh, which was a little bit unusual for a Pentecostal pastor right. at that time. This was in the, the 70s and 80s, sure. of course. Um, he was head of the Human Rights Commission or something like that back then. He had not only a, a Muncie position, but a state 
uh, okay. position in that area as well. And so I learned from him. He was just a, a fantastic giver. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, I just watched him, and I, it was really making an effect on me back at that time that really unbeknownst to me, mm -hmm. I was paying more attention than what I consciously knew because I watched how generous he was okay. uh, in every way, really. And, you know, I guess I was making mental notes without even knowing because um, I saw how blessed he was financially and in every other way, really, um, by being so generous. Okay. And so I kind of logged that in the back of my mind okay. as, as I uh, continued to grow. He left town, and so after he left, um, Pastor Larry Carther um, pastored me really for about the uh, about ten years or so uh, after I got saved. Okay, and so this was at, at Faith Center. And of course, I was doing a lot of things there: music, um, administration, teaching, preaching, all the whole thing. And so, quite frankly, my mentorship, if you will, um, had to do with just letting me let me go. I'm, I'm a pretty entrepreneurial type of thinker. And so they basically let me do what God had called me to do. Okay. Um, I was very submissive, always um, support. I wasn't trying to, you know, be the pastor or any of that kind of stuff. I had no inkling like that. But what they did, and hopefully this doesn't sound weird, they kind of got out of my way, so to speak. Okay. They, le they led me. They were my leaders, no problem. But they allowed me to teach. They allowed me to preach. Yeah. They allowed me to sing and play and all of the things that... Um, I was gifted to do without a whole lot of micromanaging and, okay, you need to do it this way, son, and all that kind of stuff that I've seen. And some people need that. That's all good. But I don't think that would have worked well um, for me because I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a thinker. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always constantly thinking about what that next thing is. And so I, I served him for 10 years. Then I, I shifted to uh, Pastor Mike Milvin. Uh, at Christ Temple uh, here in, in Muncie, and I served him for 13 years. And what I learned at that church, it was a, when I first got there, it was a traditional Pentecostal apostolic uh, oneness Pentecostal church, uh, which um, uh, some people have certain kinds of opinions about those kinds of churches, so, so to speak. But what I found is that people love God. I mean, you know, we have these little things that we have about doctrine and that, that keep us apart, but I have learned, you know, we're, there are a whole lot more things that are similar than, than, uh, uh, than apart, I suppose. And so what I learned there was a whole nother level of the fear of the Lord. I, I, and um, not, oh, I'm afraid of God, but a fear of the Lord as it relates to reverence, the reverential fear and, and uh, honor and respect. You know, God's not my buddy. God's not my boy, you know. God is God, and I need to reverence him. I need to understand that this is serious, a serious walk with God. And so I learned that at that church. And again, he had the same attitude as my former pastors. He allowed me to function, wow. you know. He allowed me to preach and teach and sing and do my thing. I ended up being a church administrator there as well, and we had daycares and different things that were going on. But... Um, it, it was a, a great experience all along, and God was teaching me all along the way and allowing me to kind of um, get my juices flowing in leadership and, and preparing me for when he would launch me. Most people would think, especially if you know you're going to pass it by 23, you'd be itching to get there and, you know, you don't want to wait till your mid-40s. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to make sure that I was in God's will. So I waited until God really kind of nudged me on out, as I was mentioning before. What's well, always neat to see when I hear people talk about their, and I ask this on every first podcast session we have with people, because I want to know really kind of where it all began and how, how you are where you are today and who kind of rubbed off on you, so to speak. Because when I look at people and I look at children, I, I, see a, I see the father and I see the mother. Some resembles more the other. Sure. And so when I think about the names, and I, I know... Pastor Maynard, or, or is he Bishop? Bishop, he's Bishop Maynard, yeah, yes, sure, yes. Sure. Now, he's heavy into the music as well, isn't he? Yeah. So yeah. it seems like you were bent always towards people who were more musically inclined. But I don't know about Pastor Carter, but they allowed you to be who you were called to be. Exactly, exactly. And so I well, see. Well, they at least valued it. Yes, you know, yes. Yeah. And then tell us a little bit. Now, I know when you when you was getting ready to launch Destiny around that time, you had went over to Union Chapel for a little bit. Yeah. So tell us about that journey. That was an interesting thing, and this is this is hopefully for somebody that might be watching. Um, you have to know God for yourself. Um, 
Not that everybody is a hater, yeah. but you have to know the voice of God for yourself. And you have to be able to discern what God is telling you to do that may not fit in everybody else's uh, wheelhouse, so to speak. Um, I got a call from Greg Paris, who is a great mentor, mm -hmm. great spiritual father, a great friend of mine, even to this day. I got a call from him. I, I wasn't n knowledgeable about what was going on in Union Chapel at the time, but he called me. Out of the blue. He had already talked to my pastor. He'd already gotten permission to call me, so he wasn't doing anything uh, out of line. And he said, hey, we've got an opening as a pr praise and worship leader at our church. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I knew Randy Craning from, from years ago. They had planted him as a church out in Fort Collins, right. Colorado. and uh, But I didn't know that they were looking for somebody. They said they'd gone through dozens and dozens of people trying to find the right person, and they just right. weren't feeling it. So I guess he inquired, and, and everybody, whoever everybody is, kept saying, okay, that Keith O'Neill dude, he's the, he's the guy. Hmm. And so here's what he's telling me this uh, as we go to lunch, and he's saying, hey, um, I know your services start at a certain time. Here's our service times. I want to know. And he, it wasn't an interview as it relates to whether or not you can qualify to get the job. It was an interview. Will you, I mean, we, this is the first wow. real conversation we'd even had Sorry. other than a couple of uh, summits that I've been through that he was there, but I didn't really mm -hmm. know Greg Paris like that. And he basically said, hey, we want you to come and lead our worship. Wow. Which is, was obviously a, a, quite an honor, but here's, here's the controversial side in, in some ways. Um, there were a lot of misconceptions about who he was. He, he's the pastor of the largest mm, church in the county right. that people had, especially in the African-American community, sure. had a, opinions about him. Sure. He's to himself. He's an introvert, kind of like I mm -hmm. am. Right. Okay, so he wasn't out. Yay, everybody. Um, and so I got a lot of pushback from mm -hmm. people saying, oh, he's this and he's that, you shouldn't, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, you know what? Had I listened to those people, wow. my life would be different today. I knew that God was taking me that way, and so I went ahead and accepted the position, and I, I led worship there for three and a half years. Three and a half, um, wow. and for those of you who don't know, Union Chapel, oh, by the way, I'm black. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Union, Union Chapel is like 99.9% .9 white. Sure. And so here's this, this white leader mm. with the largest church, literally that sure. church was over 2,000 people at the time, sure. um, who is bringing in this African-American pastor in Muncie, Indiana mm. to lead his worship. I mean, most people would think, man, you got a lot to lose if he comes in here and messes stuff up or whatever, okay. you know, who knows yeah. how they're going to respond, blah, blah, blah. But so it took some courage on his part as well. It just impressed me the kind of leader that he wow. was to be able to do that. But of course, when I went there, um, it was obviously different in terms of style and all those sure. kinds of things. But what I didn't know was God was preparing me again for leading a multiracial, multicultural, multi-ethnic sure. church. Wow. So I'm in those circles, the download, because I believe in impartation, the sure. download that was on his life. Um, came on me just like the rest of my pastors and, and mm -hmm. my experiences. Mm -hmm. And so now, of course, Destiny is a multicultural church, multiracial church, um, which is very, very unusual, period. Mm -hmm. But it's very unusual with an African-American pastor. That's, that's yeah. very, very, very rare. And so it's been pretty incredible. And it, I, I emphasize the fact that I could have missed God. Sure I could. Uh, I had all kinds of logical reasons to say, ah, no, mm -hmm. I don't think so. I could have stayed in my low comfort zone, right. listened to the haters, sure. and would have messed stuff up. So I'm very, very thankful that the, the presence of God was strong enough to overcome all of those mm -hmm. obstacles and, and for me to do that. It comes down to so often we despise preparation. I mean, nobody wants to go to school. Right, right. Nobody wants to practice or exercise to buffet themselves. But preparation is key to your destiny. So yeah, yeah. you you going for that three and a half year period, we see now right. the result that, ah, oh, I had to do this. Right. And so right. that, that's that's pretty awesome. Let, let's go on. When did, when did you know it was time for you to step out by faith and launch destiny? And was you given a prophetic word or was it something that just God had been speaking over you for a while? Here it is again. Same thing. It's, it's, that, it's that nudge. Okay. And I had I had to get used to that I mean, over the course of 20 plus years and walking with God, I, I got used to it. But um, just for those that may want their call to be more dramatic or want God to speak to them, to where, mm -hmm. ooh, 
that was God, you know, yeah. be, you know <laughs> supernatural and dramatic and all of the stuff that we, we see. Um, mine has never been really that way, you know. It's like, it's time. Hmm. It's time to step out. And it's strong enough, and I know God well enough in the way he deals with me mm -hmm. that I knew it was time. And so there was no incident. Nothing happened. I, I wasn't mad at my pastor. It's like, I'm, I'm going to branch out on my own. It wasn't anything right. like that whatsoever. I'm 45 years old. It's time. Wow. It's just really that simple. And so um, if, if you look at the natural side of it, it was the wrong time mm -hmm. to be doing that. No offense. I mean... <laughs> It's like, why are you doing this? You know, you're going from a, a, a job with a with a salary. Yeah. You have responsibility. Um, you got it pretty pretty well. And things are going pretty mm -hmm. well at the time. Um, so you, you go from that to, okay, you're going to start a church. You don't know who's going to show up. Right. You don't know if anybody's going to show up. Right. <laughs> you No more salary. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay. But I, again, I knew it was God, and so I just went ahead and, and stepped out. And again, that 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 nudge is what how God deals with me. You know, everybody has to have an understanding how they hear God. And uh, last week we was talking with Pastor Leah Britton, and she was talking about how God speaks to her. Yeah. And and I'm I'm in awe every time when I hear how she says the Lord speaks to her. And so you've got to know first off how the Lord speaks, that and right. and that and that comes into relationship. Sure. Some people just want God to speak a prophetic word or have somebody come and say, thus saith the Lord. But it doesn't always work like right. that. You right. have to understand how to hear God's voice. And so it's interesting how the Lord nudged you in your calling. And in the same way, yeah. we hear him nudging you to do something that's, right. you know, not comfortable to do. <laughs> and so you, you, you've shared this story many times before with other in our church and stuff. But you had mentioned before that how many people were coming up to you saying, Bishop O'Neill, Elder O'Neill, right. if you do this, we'll go and su support you. So was there a factor in there that came in? Well, I know if I go and launch this church, at least I have these people. Did What was going through your mind uh, in that moment in your life? Was it was it a factor in there to, to say, okay, I can do this? It, it really wasn't. We started with eight people. Yeah. Okay. Um, we had a meeting in my living room of people that... Uh, had identified themselves that mm -hmm. wanted to be a part of what we were doing. And two of those were my, were my kids. Right. A couple others were good friends of mine. Sure. So some of that was kind of logical in, yeah, in terms of who showed up. Um, but no, it, it really wasn't. Interestingly enough, along the way, you know, I was involved in ministry. I was pretty good at what I did in terms of music and making records and things like that. And so I had some level of capacity. My, my family name was pretty good in Muncie and people mm -hmm. knew the name. And so lots of people came along and tried to push me before my time. That mm -hmm. was the part of it that I had to fight against, so to speak. Sure. Hey, you know, you know, pastor at the time, it wasn't pastor, like elder. Yeah. Hey, elder O'Neill, <laughs> you know what? Hey man, if you ever start a church, man, I'm, I'll, I'm, I'm right there with you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be with you. I, I can't wait till you, you know what? Not one of those people are in our church right now to this day, not one. And so you got to know what God is saying to you. you. You can't get influenced by other people. And so if, if you, if you start on the premise of people, mm -hmm then you got to end that way. Mm. I mean, if you put in your life uh, and your future in the hands of people who are fickle, you, let's not forget. I don't want to get too preachy here. Sure. Let's not forget that the same folks that said to Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna, okay. are the same folks <laughs> the next, the, I mean, him. within a few days, crucify him. Right. This is how fickle people are. So That's you it. cannot, you know, hopefully somebody who's watching That's can That's really it. get that. You cannot make your decisions yeah. based upon people. That's they will right. flip on you in a moment. Mm. And so you got to know the voice of God. That's the bottom line. That's good. I know, I know we always hear, you know, you're always going to have haters. And you preached on this. If you're from Destiny, this is not unfamiliar statements that these are these are very familiar for us. And haters are always going to hate, you always say. And, but you always, I've been thinking about this. You're always going to have naysayers that are going to say, you right. can't do this. Right. But you, you got to be careful almost as well as the yaysayers. Right. I'm going to make up a word. Right. The yaysayers, because they're going to be, I'm with you behind you, right. and then turn their back and stab you in the back at some say in some, at some situations. So we got to be careful who's speaking into our life as well. Yeah. We we got to shut down the naysayers and the yaysayers and understand I'm doing this because 
the Lord is directing me and telling Absolutely. me to do what I'm called to do. So that's, that's good. Now, some of you that are watching or may not know, uh, Bishop is what I call, he is an INTJ. And uh, for you watching here on, on YouTube or, or listening to us on podcasts or, or Spotify, you, you're understanding, if you're familiar with the Myers-Briggs program, he is what I call a one percenter. Uh, and what a one percenter is, he only makes up one percent of the population. And so that personality type is what they say. And so this personality type is a visionary. They see things there. I will, let's just say it this way in a, in, a, in a nice term. They're peculiar. And so they don't, uh, how would I say it this way? They don't go at the beat of everybody else's drum. They go at their own beat. They're going by what they feel at that moment. This is what I know I'm supposed to do. And so a lot of people are fearful of you, of that personality, because you, you, you're so out there. Now, I don't like saying this often, but uh, one of the Myers-Briggs says that the INTJ is labeled as genius. Now, I'm not trying to blow his head up and, uh, <laughs> and let him know, but that personality to understand that because you think so much outside the box. So that being said, uh, where do you see destiny? For, for those that are watching now and listening, since you are that visionary uh, leader, uh, where do you see destiny in the next five years? Yeah, I, obviously you, you can't always know exactly the in-betweens and how things are going to manifest. Mm -hmm. But I've always felt as though destiny was supposed to make not only a local and a regional, but a national and international uh, impact. Mm -hmm. I named the church before we had not one member, right. Destiny Christian Center International. So something down in my spirit mm -hmm. said, we're going to have a major impact, whatever that means. Yeah. And so looking toward the future and, and, you know, with all the things that are going on currently with COVID and, and, and coming out of that at some point in time, prayerfully this year, what does ministry look like? It it's really hasn't changed. I feel like Destiny's reach is going to continue to grow. I think we have just now come into a season where the reason why God birthed us mm -hmm. at 15, okay. we're just now seeing it. All the, all the preparation, just, just like when you have a newborn baby, you've got two children, sure. I've got two children, okay? When they're little bitty babies, they need all of our attention. I mean, they can't survive without us. Not one second. They can't eat. They can't change themselves. None of, none of that. They don't know the language, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So you nurture them. You bring them to a point. Now your kids could, could thrive on their own. They, sure. could, they could be fine. And so I think destiny was in preparation all of these years. We're cutting our teeth on ministry, mm -hmm. cutting our teeth on missions work and international uh, impact and preaching and teaching and deliverance, which is a an area of our ministry that most ministries don't have, which I think is is something that uh, our our secret sauce, one of them, sure. of, of course. And so now, 15 years of preparation. Now we are entering in to the area that I think we're going to maybe uh, go a little faster in terms of expansion and the impact that we're designed to make in the next four to five years, as, as you have mentioned. So I see us getting more into pro, uh, providing music sure. uh, internationally in terms of putting out music. Uh, those where my writing, others that are in our church that can write, we're going to start putting out things that can speak to some of the things that are going on in our communities from a place of revelation. I mean, I, I feel like literally I can speak about racial, about diversity, about uh, ethnicity, and even from w within the church structures, uh, from a place of authority, because we're doing this. Sure. You know, we're, we're manifesting this. And so I, th I see Destiny making those kinds of inroads uh, nationally. Well, here we're seeing with all the, the diversity and all the divisiveness that we see, all of this stuff that is going on in our nation, we need some revelation on how Amen. to get along. Amen. How, can, how can we just come into the same proximity and not kill each other? You know what I'm saying? That's interesting. So I see Destiny having uh, all kinds of impact. On a practical side, I see us having a youth camp. We've got 22 acres on our main campus. Right. Um, we've owned three daycares, of course, you know that. And so um, I see that expanding because that, those are the areas that we can make impact on young people. 
Um, we just hired uh, Daniel. We uh, interviewed him not too long ago, sure. in a, a few weeks ago. And, and so the whole um, international flavor, if you will, the whole ethnic reach right. um, is expanding. So I see all of those things manifesting at different levels uh, in our church in the next four to five years to where we'll have multiple campuses. We're, we're going to be planting churches. Of course, right. you know this. We're yeah. going to be planting you on the campus. Um, and so what we want to do is make sure that we're continuing to further the gospel. Mm -hmm. At the end of all the stuff that we, all the programming, all the stuff that we do, the bottom line is the souls of men and women. That's what we're going after, and that's what Amen. God has called us to do. Amen. Got that purpose, and, and definitely, if you're watching or listening right now, I know you're hearing that, you're hearing the visionary, and I, I love to listen to visionaries. Not everybody does, and so I am an ENFJ, and my, my juices get turned because we are doers. And so when I hear somebody saying, this is what I see, my first thought is like, what can I do, you know, to make this happen? Right, so right. it's exciting. So Bishop, we're going to close this out, but talk to someone who may be listening right now or watching that's contemplating stepping out by faith like you were just 15 years ago and uh, launching into full-time ministry even. What would you suggest for them to do right now, counting the cost, so to speak? Well, you know, Jesus tells us to count the cost. What person goes into war without first contemplating, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, uh, whether or not you can win, if you've got 10,000, you're going against somebody that's got 15,000. The point is, what person would just willy-nilly go into a situation without pr preparation? And so you got to prepare. You got to do the work. You, you got you to put in the time to, to make the decision. But after you've done all of that, However God is speaking to you, however God communicates to you, um, for me, it was that nudge. For you, it might be some other way. Don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Listen, God has not given us the spirit of fear. You've done the work. You've done the research. You, you got the data, if you will. You got the nudge. Well, one of my favorite scriptures in Ecclesiastes says, He that regards the wind will not sow. He that regards the clouds will not reap. What does that mean? That means if you wait for everything to be perfect, all your ducks in a row, you'll never do anything. Because from a natural standpoint, it may never be the right time. But if you know you've done the work, and you know you're feeling that nudge, and you have your juices flowing, and you can see yourself as the head pastor. You can see yourself as that business owner. You can see yourself as that ministry that blows up. Listen, what do you got to lose? Okay, so it doesn't work in five minutes. Okay, sorry. Maybe maybe it's going to take a little longer than you thought, you know, but don't be afraid to step out. Think in terms of what's the worst case scenario. Okay, I can do something else. Okay, mm, worst case scenario. But if, if you don't step out, if you don't take that chance, if you don't take that risk, and I know a lot of people in the church don't like that term risk as though everything is going to be perfect. Listen, do, have you read your Bible? There's a whole lot of folks that stepped out on things that didn't work out exactly like they thought. Listen, so don't be afraid. That's the main thing. Don't be afraid to take a step and follow that nudge. Listen. Don't always think, what happens if it doesn't work? What happens if it does? Yeah. What happens if you open up Destiny and you have your first service? It has 75 people because all your friends and neighbors are coming. But then the next week, you only got 35 at your real first service. You know, you stepped out. You left this salary. You're hoping people show up. You're hoping they give. Listen, what happens if your church grows? What happens if your business flourishes? Why don't you think like that? So don't be afraid. I don't think like, well, what happens if it's not going to work? No, it's what if it does? I'm believing that it will. So I want to encourage you to step out. Don't be afraid. Listen, worst case scenario, you go get a job again. Worst case scenario, you go find somebody else to serve. You know, don't be afraid to move out. That's the bottom line. Amen. What's your, what you, you have many mantras, but what's that mantra you say about faith? Let them hear about that. The only thing you're going to get. The only thing you're going to get from God is going to be by faith. That's it. It's, it's, it's about faith. And listen, God doesn't tell us all the steps. He doesn't tell us exactly. Listen, truth be told, I thought our church would be 10,000 by now. Yeah. <laughs> That's where my faith is. That's what I'm thinking. That's how far out. I, I think we're going to get there eventually, whatever that means uh, in 21st century uh, ministry. But the bottom line is, listen, 
Faith means seeing it in the spirit, going after it. Because faith without works, faith without corresponding action is dead. So you got to put some feet to your faith. Yes, you believe it's going to happen, but we're going to find out if you really believe it by whether or not you step out. Amen. So that's that's the deal. That's Amen. where you have to exercise some faith. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this this week. I, I mean, I'm being blessed over here, but me and him talk quite often. But it's just it's just great to hear faith be released. And so I, I pray that you receive from the man of God this 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 time that you're watching or listening right now. And uh, I just appreciate it. But I want you to join us next week as uh, Bishop O'Neill will be on my panel again as we discuss being right. One of your mantras, <laughs> being right is overrated. So yeah. again, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe. And, uh, and I believe that you'll be blessed as the weeks go on and share this broadcast if you're on Facebook as well. Good day. God bless. We'll see you again on Bridging the Gap.